You're watching News 12 on your side. From the station that's on your side, breaking news. Good evening. We begin with this breaking news out of Aiken County, where officials say there's a long brush fire burning right now in Jackson, South Carolina. We're told there's a two-mile stretch on fire right near Main Street. We're not really sure yet if there's any homes or businesses around that area that are at risk, but we do have crews on the way out to the scene. Going to show you a live look now at the fire from our Beach Island camera. You can kind of see where that smoke is burning along several stretches along that two-mile area. Yeah, we also have a crew on the way there, and, and we'll continue to keep you updated as we learn more. But as you can tell, these are dry conditions. It's a long two-mile stretch of dry, mostly forested-looking area over there. As we check in with First Alert Chief Meteorologist, just Riley Hill, not the best of conditions in the for forecast. All right, thanks for that, Riley. Richmond County authorities are still trying to figure out what happened after deputies found two people dead in a home on Maryland Avenue this week. We do know the landlord is the one who called deputies who found those bodies, but details are still very limited. The two were in a home here on Maryland Avenue. Richmond County Coroner Mark Bowen says the deaths are considered suspicious and they have been dead for some time. The victims were sent to the GBI crime lab for positive ID and autopsy. As of tonight, neither the names or cause of death have been officially released, but it's a story we will continue tracking for you. Continue on News 12 at 6 o'clock. Cases of sexual assault are on the rise here at home. News 12's Will Rio talked to experts about their message for survivors. At Augusta University, Shelly Larkin serves as the Director of Student Health Services. We're glad you came in. But she serves a bigger role as the Chair of the Sexual Assault Response Team in the Augusta Judicial Circuit. We are seeing an uptick already in 2023 as well. She's referring to the amount of sexual assault cases reported in the CSRA. Locally, there's an average of about 187 cases that were reported to law enforcement and the Rape Crisis Center. I think coming out of COVID, you're seeing a lot of that, and I do agree we're seeing our younger population, 14 to 18 years old. You're going to see in the research as well that most violence is going to happen by the time they turn 18, whether that's childhood violence, sexual trauma, some kind of personal violence, and we're seeing it more and more with dating violence as well in that population. In the CSRA, Larkin says only about 20% of sexual assault victims report crimes against them. A new CDC report shows the percentage of young females who have ever been forced to have sex increased from 2011 to 2021. Our goal is that they report so that we can help them and we can provide resources. Larkin says resources like schools, police, safe homes, the Child Enrichment Center, and every hospital offer services to help victims. She says early education is important, like the events AU sets up every year to show support and provide outlets for sexual assault victims. You have more than just one person that can surround you with help in our area. In Augusta, Will Rio on your side. Larkin says as a part of her sexual assault response team, the state mandates they have a protocol in place with the chief justices in the judicial circuit to make sure they have resources and reporting in place for victims. State authorities say an Aiken County man is facing several charges of sexual exploitation of minors after federal investigators got a tip. The South Carolina Attorney General's Office says Kenneth Smith is charged with five counts of sexual exploitation. If convicted, he could face up to 50 years in prison. Augusta's new EMS subcommittee having its first meeting tomorrow. Leaders are expected to talk about the city's goals for this new EMS system, response times, plans on how ambulances will coordinate with the city fire department, and more. That committee just formed yesterday after Augusta moved forward with the state's recommended EMS provider, Central Emergency Services Management. Leaders in Augusta celebrating... So, Craig, what steps has the city taken to develop that neighborhood into the thriving Midtown area that we heard the director mention. Yeah, this whole area, including the plot of land that we're standing on, is management. Leaders in Augusta celebrating the preservation of a landmark in the Laney Walker Bethlehem neighborhood. The C.T. Walker House was home to Reverend C.T. Walker back in the day, the founder of the historic Tabernacle Baptist Church in Augusta. It's not yet clear what the city will do with this building once they do own it, but the city leaders are dreaming big. The whole mindset is to create a thriving midtown. Whether that midtown is for breakfast in the morning, whether it's for coffee in the afternoon, whether it's to get a donut, whether it's for lunch. We want to be sure that for the most part, that what we said and what the commission allowed for us to be able to do, that we're doing that to the highest and best of our ability. 
so today represents the latest piece in this puzzle to revitalize the Laney Walker area. Those plans have been in the works for years, but today the city celebrates the purchase of the C.T. Walker House and other plots of land as part of that larger project. News 12 City Beat reporter Craig Allison live for us from Laney Walker Boulevard right now. So, Craig, what steps has the city taken to develop that neighborhood into the thriving Midtown area that we heard the director mention? Yeah, this whole area, including the plot of land that we're standing on right now, is set for more development with the city's over decade-long plan to revitalize the Laney Walker area. And with economic growth that has doubled the average household income from 16000 back in 2008, they say now is time for growth to fill in those gaps. This goes real deep. You know, and this, is, this is really the mecca of the black history portion of Augusta, Georgia. Leon Maven is from the Laney Walker area and has lived here on and off for 60 years. He says it was about 10 years ago when he heard about the city's revitalization plan that he moved back. I feel real good right now for, for what I see, but what I don't want to happen is that for this community to, uh, with this revitalization to lose the character and the history of this community. The Housing and Community Development Department says that growth is in the six to eight plots of land they have acquired through the help of the city and the land bank. What that does is allow for us now to truly have the conversation about a growth store, to truly have conversation about deli, to truly have the conversation about coffee shops, and anything everybody that makes person feel good. So now is the time to say, okay, what is truly the plan? This is just the beginning of what we believe will be the revitalization and the, and the rebirth of not just Laney Walker as a, as a neighborhood, but as a thriving community. But it's not without its worries. But I hope that with this new prosperity coming in, that it does not force my old neighbors out. And Housing and Community Development says that they will have another major announcement the week after Masters with this revitalization. But for now, in Laney Walker, Craig Allison on your side. All right, thanks, Craig. Leaders in Columbia County are looking at the possibility of creating a city outside of Harlem and Grovetown. Right now, those are the only two cities in the county. The rest, like Evans and Appling, those are all unincorporated communities. But some leaders want to change that. They want to study what it might look like if Columbia County becomes its own city. News Pals Nick Beeland live for us in Evans tonight. So, Nick, what are the pros and cons here? Yeah, well, leaders are hoping that once this study goes out, it'll come back with clear information of what it may look like with Columbia County becoming its own city. And city leaders are optimistic, or county leaders, excuse me, are optimistic that this will come back with more pros than cons. If there would not be an additional layer of government, there would not be any additional taxes. But some people like Lee Munns are skeptical. Munns says he doesn't see any benefits to the change. Governance wise, no. Um, sheriff's department wise, no. Um, fire department wise, no. Um, water and sewer, no. County manager Scott Johnson says this change wouldn't impact the way the current government and sheriff's office do things. Johnson says there are some negatives with this. The cities of Harlan and Grovetown would be, uh, they would have the same land area that they have today. To build for a study can cost up to $100,000, something Johnson says will be worth the price tag. We're looking for a efficiency and functionality study. It, it has to do with consolidation. And this isn't the first time this has been attempted either. The county looked into this as early as 2006. It's never been done exactly the way Columbia County would have to do it before. We are very much an anomaly. Um, so uh, I, I think it is a heavy lift. For some, they wish communication was a little clearer about the move the county is making. At the end of the day, you need to do a very good job of explaining wholesale change to the community before you start putting that And Scott Johnson told me that the study isn't where this ends. Afterwards, or the county is hoping to hold public information sessions to hear public input. That's before this is going to be put into legislation that goes to the state house, and then that ultimately will be on the ballot for voters to decide whether they want this to happen or not. And he says that this is still a year to a year and a half out.
Okay, we know that we have not heard nearly the end of this. People are going to have a lot of thoughts, so thanks for breaking that down for us, Nick. Okay, check this out. Masters champion Scotty Scheffler decided on his menu when he hosts the Masters, uh, the champion's dinner this year. He says he would serve steak and cheeseburger sliders with family-style dishes, Texas redfish for people who don't like beef, chocolate chip cookies and ice cream. It's one of those skillet cookies. It sounds delicious. You yeah. get a little tortilla soup. It, uh, it does sound really good. Kind of a variety there. She, uh, Chef Rochelle that menu today during a video call. He's going to be back at Augusta National, of course, next month, defending his title and the champion. Gets to line up the menu That's whatever right. he wants. So he's going to throw some sliders at the other guys. Yes, you know, and a little bit of steak. Yeah. Looks like a good, a good meal. Some seafood on the side, maybe surf and turf. Yeah. All right, coming up, Aiken Springs Storytime is back in full force at Rise Patch. How the city is bringing their stories to life. And we do have a freeze warning in effect again tonight, and we are tracking some rain moving in by Friday. We'll have an update on the full forecast just after the break. Time. If you're traveling to Savannah, their parade starts a little bit earlier Friday morning, just after 10 a.m. Temperatures will be in the mid-60s around the start of that parade in Savannah. By the time our starts here in Augusta, we should be in the mid-70s. Past the weekend, we are going to stay pretty chilly next week with highs in the 50s next Monday and Tuesday. The city of Aiken is holding storytime events at Rise Patch again, and more than 100 people showed up. News Channel's Will Pope went over to see how Aiken is bringing stories to life for kids and their families. Fiddle me, dude, it's magic it is. Kind of a highlight of my week because it's very peaceful. He hopped and he popped. Benny Ryberg loves doing this. I like it so much because I like to see the children in a casual atmosphere. She volunteers to read to kids in Aiken's Rye Patch. Now, almost 150 people sit on the lawn for story time every week. Five, hold up your hands. Let me it, it's five. five. This is a great time to be uh, outside, outdoors, and also to find friends and also to read books. Erica Parrish says it's fun for her daughter. She's thankful because every family who comes gets a free book. So it gets children understanding actually how to read a book how to go through page by page that's really important ryberg says it's a great way to introduce kids to reading it's not a classroom it's not at a desk it's not in a chair it's on the grass outside who do you think they're gonna trap and how much do the kids enjoy it let's ask christy a hundred percent in aiken will bolt on your side Updating this breaking news out of Jackson, South Carolina, where, as we mentioned, a freight train has apparently um, sparked a, about two miles worth of fires along those tracks. It's along the Main Street area, that corridor, about two miles long, as we mentioned, and you can see crews out there trying to put out some of those hot spots. It doesn't look like we've seen a lot of roaring flames at this point, but a lot of smoldering, and with conditions like we're seeing today, those high fire risks, that can spark up really quickly. They cannot take any chances there. Our tower cam shot earlier showed quite a bit of smoke. Smoke, so it's good to see those crews on the scene, making sure there are no hot spots along two miles of track. So a lot of scene there for them to cover this evening. And we've got more News 12 coming up right after this quick break. Investigate. On your sideline, sports brought to you by the Hawk Law Group. To Sports Now, where News 12's Alyssa Lyons is live at Sage Valley Golf Club in Graniteville. The Sage Valley Junior Invitational starts tomorrow. So, Alyssa, who do we need to be keeping our eyes out for? Pretty much everybody, because it's the most competitive field yet. And most of them already rank in their top ten of their respective fields. You may even recognize a few of their swings. A return to the field for Anna Davis. You know, the golf course we play and the way they treat us is just like beyond what any other golf tournament does. A first for South Africa's Aldridge Potsvater. It's always nice to um, start a competition with a new field that I'm not familiar with, but I'm um, having a smaller field. It's, it's kind of nice. It's not overcrowded. The driving range, it's enough space. Davis finished third last year before heading across the river and capturing the Augusta National Women's Amateur title. Like the pressure it can be a little much, but I think I don't know, you just have to like remember it's just not that deep, like you're playing golf, like it's okay. There's more to life than just, you know, hitting a golf ball around. So I think that's kinda that's kinda my mindset with the whole thing. Hawkeider was the youngest in this year's field at the open championship at St Andrews. It was awesome being at St Andrews and um, meeting all the the heroes of my 
of me growing up. So it was nice seeing them and um, getting to play with them and having an awesome experience. Hot Rider punched his ticket to the Masters. I got the invite late. They sent it to a wrong address, so I had to contact them. They asked if I got the invite yet, and I said I haven't. So it was a bit of a struggle to get it, but it arrived. So that's a relief, yeah. Now, he usually deals about a, with a six-hour time difference, so he'll have to do that twice this month. No pressure there. And with Anna Davis, hey, there is nothing lost on her because last year we know that she sold out bucket hats probably faster than gnomes. She actually went back to San Diego, and they said it cleaned off shelves. She had no idea the impact her wearing, on, wearing a bucket hat could even have. You just never know who's watching out there and who's looking for a new trend, Alyssa. Thanks. She, she does look right at home in a bucket hat, too, so she wears it well. Moving on now, officials of Fort Gordon say it's not official that the Eisenhower family will be here for the redesignation ceremony to change the installation's name and the date for that ceremony not yet finalized. They say it'll happen sometime this fall, likely around October. Fort Gordon, one of several military installations around the country, getting a new name because of the connection to Confederate military leaders. And now, if you're planning to drive across the state line overnight this week, GDOT says they're going to be closing down that right lane heading westbound. That'll be from South Carolina into Georgia each night through Friday. The lane will be closed from mile marker 1 in South Carolina over to mile marker 200 in Georgia as they get ready for a big lane shift through that construction zone. So big changes are just ahead. This piece of the work is expected to be wrapped up by Monday as long as weather cooperates. But that, that new westbound bridge looks like it is ready to roll. The 49th annual Hopelands Concert Series is getting ready to start back up soon. The first show of the year is scheduled for Monday, April 3rd. The show will feature a band called The Lady and the Gents, an R&B and smooth jazz band. The concert series will run at Hopeland Gardens in Aiken through June 26th. So now all we need is that spring-like weather back, Riley. I know it's taken a hiatus over the last couple of days. Unfortunately, it's staying pretty chilly over the next week or so. Likely a frost delay at Sage Valley tomorrow morning, but it should be a really nice afternoon for the Junior Invitational. Now look at our seven-day forecast just after the break. Thanks for watching News 12 on your side. The accident was not my fault. When you're injured, you need help fast. Call George Sink Injury Lawyers all night. You need someone that's going to fight for you. Call now. Call George Sink Injury Lawyers at all night. We've got you.